Okay, I'm, I'm here with uh, having a chat with Geroid Toei. Toei. I was actually going to ask you to say your name. Geroid. Geroid Toei. Okay, yeah. so that's who it is. It's an Irish name. <laughs> I always have difficulty with Irish names. I've heard about you from a number of people. Uh, Jamie Fuller from Skins has referenced you. You've, you've done some lecture circuits with him, I think. And you're yeah, actually who I did my first talking cycling piece with. And uh, Michael Drapak referenced you in a new role you've got with the Drapak or Candale Drapak team. Yeah. But basically, you, you're the manager or owner of a company called Crossing the Line. Can you give us a little overview of how that came about? Yeah, so I was a rower. Um, I was a, I was an Olympic rower. I did I did three Olympics for Ireland um, and all the World Championships in between. So I had a long long career. Which Olympics? Uh, Sydney, mm -hmm. Athens, Beijing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I went went to them, did all the World Champs in between. So it was quite a kind of an intense career for a long time. And then I retired in at Beijing. Literally, that's the last time I took a stroke in rowing. Was it? <laughs> I just left. I was really happy to be finished. Did you stand on the podium ever? Not at the Olympics. No. At the Worlds a couple of times, mm -hmm. um, but not at the Olympics, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately. Um, so, so I left. I was really happy to be retiring. I was kind of, you know, looking forward to my new life. Uh, no, no more training, no more dieting, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I had a degree, so I was pretty well set up. I thought, you know, kind of in terms of next career or. Um, but I was kind of wrong because I didn't really factor in, you know, the kind of identity loss that you have when you finish your sport. I didn't really take into consideration how much my identity was tied to my sport, mm -hmm. um, even though I had loads of outside interests. Um, so I was quite shocked when I had a bit of like an identity crisis um, about a year out from the Olympics. So that was the first time I ever kind of had this, you know, what am I going to do next question, you know, um, kind of appeared. and that's very kind of profound for somebody who's always had your year planned and ready for you from the age of like 14 or 15, you knew exactly what you were doing year in, year out. And then suddenly when you realize that you don't have that anymore, it can come as a bit of a shock. And it was a massive shock to me. Um, and no one really at that time had told me it was going to be so difficult. Um, so I did a bit of soul searching and whatnot and you know, a bit of traveling and, and um, at that time, kind of discovered that there was no real support network for athletes when they finish. It's a bit of a first world problem, really, you know, but um, it's a real problem, you know, so so I I was surprised that there was no centralized resource, like I was Googling kind of athlete retirement, athlete transition, depression or whatever, and there was nothing there. I found a few articles, a couple of books, but it was nothing centralized. And then this, that kind of, the deeper I went with the whole thing I realized that it was a massive issue like there was like multiple suicides there was you know lots of athletes in jail um, lots of athletes with um, divorces depression the whole lot and so I thought to myself wow this is a huge problem and once I saw the issue I started to think about how I could help and so that's how the website came about essentially and your degree is natural science Okay. which is completely connected to what I'm doing now. Not. not. <laughs> <laughs> I did it to tick a box in a way, because like I was big into adventure, so I, you know, during my rowing career I did stuff like uh, the transatlantic rowing race, and I do um, expedition races, you know, the multi-sport, um, multi-day races, mm -hmm. love them. And so I was very connected to nature, mountains, oceans, and the idea of doing my degree in natural science was to be like a field field uh, technician um, down in Antarctica, something like that. That's, the, that's where my head was going with that. But like really it was just to kind of get a degree. So there wasn't that much thought put into it, which is something looking back that I regret because you know, really if you're thinking about a new career after sport, it's connected to your passion. You have to be passionate about what you're doing. And that's a, that's a journey that takes a while really, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I did the Atlantic, Transatlantic rowing race in 2005, and that kind of changed my my outlook with adventure a little bit because we we nearly we nearly died a few times in that trip. Um, so I kind of thought to myself, I'd like to enjoy my life a little bit okay. more before heading on more adventures. <laughs>
developing other identities outside of the sport, the better. Mm. So that all comes down to this identity, um, you know, uh, diversity in a way. Like so, if you're an athlete, your your um, your identity is tied very much into your sport. So it's putting all your eggs in one basket. So that puts a lot of pressure on subconsciously. So you know, you're like everything is driven towards getting a result. You have to, um, you know. If I don't get a result in this race, it's you know it's going to kind of break me because you know this is all I have. So mm. whereas you know the studies, the research out there shows that athletes who are engaged in stuff outside of their sport do actually show that you know they're actually benefiting in training and racing from actually doing something else because it's taking their mind away from it mm. and it's taking the pressure off their subconscious. You know because they have something else to fall back on. And so okay, um, like you don't lose that need to win but in the event that you don't win the fall isn't going to be so great because at least you have this you know so yeah. um, it actually benefits performance this is all this is all performance enhancing you know so athlete welfare and the stuff that I'm going to be doing with Candel Drapek you know has traditionally been seen as a nice to have you know it's kind of like it hasn't been seen as a as a, an essential part of the high performance mix and in fact, it is, you know, um, the more balanced, the happier, um, the more, um, I guess, more things going on in an athlete's life that's not just their sport, the better they will be at their sport. Um, the research is there. The Australian Sports Commission did research in 2010, which showed that. So, um, uh, so the, it's a cultural thing. So, you know, uh, there's lots of emphasis put on, f you know, physio, sports psychology, physiology, equipment, like millions being pumped into this, but there isn't so much money being pumped into, well, how is the human being that sits behind the athlete? How is that person? And quite often that person is extremely fragile mm -hmm. and isn't as strong as what they're showing to the outside. Yeah. So, you know, all this stuff, um, you know, can lead to burnout. So if an athlete is kind of holding their shit together, for want of a better word, barely, you know, and producing these results, but kind of in, despite, in spite of themselves, then that athlete, you know, their career won't be as long. Mm. And they will have fewer wins because they're really holding on to this kind of um, illusion that they're okay, you know? So there isn't a lot of time spent asking, um, asking athletes the questions, how are you? It's actually quite a confronting question for an athlete because the answers invariably will come back, yeah, yeah, I'm good, training's going really well, really good, I won a race last week, um, not so good, you know, I'm, I'm not losing, I'm, like, I'm not winning many races at the moment, you know, so that's, it's always tied to their sport, but if you say, no, no, forget about your sport, how are you? That's a very confronting question for an athlete because a lot of athletes don't actually have a clue who they are, deep down. Um, and so the more time we can spend working uh, with athletes in that space, the better they're going to be as, as performers for sure. I think there's a key player in Australian sport or cycling, which is my sport, that's uh, about to come into that understanding, and that's Anna Mears. You know, she's been a highly successful athlete, she's won gold medals at the Olympics and, and been flag bearer for Australia at the most recent Olympics. And, what would you say to her at this point? You know, let's let's use her as a little case example. What what lessons could you give her to, from the experiences you've had already? Yeah, I I think for somebody like Anna Mears, who's a real, I mean, she's a legend. You know, she's kind of larger than life legend of the sport. Um, you know, she's world renowned. People in the UK, she's actually very famous in the UK mm -hmm. because of her her um, rivalry. Um, and for someone like her, who's had such a long career, a very successful career, I'd say take your time, you know, take your time to make decisions. One of the, one of the um, key mistakes a lot of athletes make, especially successful athletes, is that they want to be successful straight away in something else, straight away. So like it's, they don't take the time to build up. So they have to, okay, I'm going to be a brilliant estate agent. And they just go headlong into this, not really thinking that, you know, they might hate being an estate agent. Mm -hmm. So the success becomes bigger than the actual, um, the reason why they're doing it, you know, so lots of athletes do that, they go from job to job to job because they're not satisfied in the jobs, they discover they don't like them um, after a period of six months and then what happens is they get more and more 
down on themselves because they're not succeeding, you know, at, at these jobs because they don't like them. So if they spend a bit more time discovering what, what their next passion is and what they really do like, what makes them tick, what their personality is, who they are as humans, um, then, then they will probably find a career that will suit them a lot better than just going for it. So my advice would be take your time, you know, um, and also the fact that, you know, life is a lot different on the outside so when you're, you're when you're in the sporting world and I was guilty of this and I, and, and I know loads of athletes who say the same thing I always thought life after sport was going to be a doddle like I thought what I was doing was so hard and that everything I did after my sport was going to be a doddle right and uh, and, and then you, you realize the grand illusion absolutely yeah. and then you realize how lucky you really were to absolutely. just be paddling that boat and have no other so, Absolutely, you know, um, we didn't have to pay taxes, we didn't have to do accounts, we didn't have to do any of this stuff that mm -hmm. you got to do in, in real life. But I know it doesn't sound like much, mm -hmm. but actually, you know, if you don't do your tax returns, if you don't, you know, um, do your finances, that adds stress to your life, you know, and it's, these are stresses that you you've never had as an athlete. And, you know, I think a lot of athletes don't understand how difficult life is after sport mm -hmm. in that regard, and how easily you can get stressed about little things you know the little things can really stress you out so um, I think getting a concept of like going okay life is going, it's still going to be hard but in a different way mm. when I talk to athletes or consider the greater context of what I'm trying to do with my magazine and that is to inspire people to ride their bikes. That's, that should be the remit. A sport is the thing that it is because it, it appeals to people mm. aesthetically and uh, it, it, it pulls people in and it makes, it, it warms the cockles of yeah. the heart or whatever it does. I don't know what sport does apart from give people uh, a distraction from the everyday mm. You know, I've come across, you know, the various times in my career, you know, like I, you could do all this amazing stuff and go out and race against the best in the world and then the following day you struggle to post a letter. Yes. You know what I mean? That's, that's very common. You know, mm -hmm. so, you, um, you know, there's, there's also a lot of stuff around, you know, within the athletic population as a whole. Um, you know, there, there is quite a number of athletes who, you know, a lot of people don't believe in, in ADHD or ADD, but being on that spectrum of, you know, um, attention deficit or uh, lots of athletes are on that spectrum. Because you know, it, it, a sport lends itself to that. You know, mm -hmm. um, the hyper focus, being being really focused on one thing that you're interested in, and stuff that you're not interested in is a is a nightmare. You know, so um, stuff like that. You know, when you retire, um, you you uh, whilst those those kind of conditions might be good for sport, and you're you're treating yourself with, with your with your training. So sport could be. The replacement for Ritalin is the absolutely, right? absolutely, hundred percent. But then, when you finish your sport, if you don't know that you you have this condition, or or um, then you know it wears its ugly head again. But in the real world, so like you're you're you don't have your sport anymore. So now you're you're dealing with ADD mm. in the real world, mm. and um, you, you might be doing stuff you're not very really interested in. And some of the ADD they don't like doing stuff they're interested in. So then that the cycle of failure happens and then what happens is that people's self-esteem gets really knocked you know and athletes are generally very tough on themselves yeah. in terms of succeeding and doing the right thing um you know that if they're not seen to be doing the right thing or they're kind of because they're interested really in what they're doing then that the cycle starts and sometimes athletes just can't get off it And do you think they're more introverted because they've come off that cycle? So they have been in the public eye, they come off the public eye and then they, they retreat into themselves. Is that part of it? Or there's, there's narcissistic yeah. tendencies in everyone, isn't there? Yeah, well, I think, I think what it is, is is that, you know, it's kind of a strange thing to say, but uh, for an athlete, like competing at the Olympics or competing at the Tour de France is their comfort zone because they, that's what they know, that's what they, that's what they do every day. Mm. It's, what, it's where they know what they're doing, when and what their performance is going to be. It's a very measured environment that they're very comfortable in. So for a lot of athletes, being 
competing in something that extreme is actually their comfort zone. Mm. So when that stops, suddenly they're put into a world then where, where they don't have those anchor points anymore. And um, so lots of athletes then in that situation rather than going headlong into it and discussing what's going on for them, can tend to retreat in mm. because they're not used to um, showing their vulnerable side. Yeah. Because sport doesn't lend itself to that or um, the sporting environment doesn't lend itself to that, the culture. Yeah. It's all about, you know, showing your best side and not, and not showing your, your weaknesses. Um, but, you know, really showing your weaknesses is actually your strength. You know, as we all know, you know, like, that's the case, but the sporting world is way behind in that regard, you know. Yeah. The athletes are still afraid to, 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 to show their um, vulnerable side, yeah. It's a real simple premise, but the problem shared is a problem halved or something along mm. those lines. And that is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. You, know, you bowl it up, you bowl it up, and then you tell someone you don't know why you're telling them. But once you've done so, you feel a lot better about it. But that's the idea of this um, Are You OK Day, for example. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and the thing is with sport, like we do we do the, our workshops we're crossing the line where we, where we go out to teams and um, you know, and we, we talk to the athletes about you know self awareness and teach them some skills around that. And we'd always do a questionnaire afterwards, like an anonymous questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions we ask is is uh, what's the biggest block to you um, divulging your personal problems? And the number one that comes back is fear of deselection. So the fear of the coach seeing him in a different light, which might impact the selection. Uh, yeah, that's 100%. Like, always comes back as the, as the winner. <laughs> so for 18 year olds who's just signed a pro contract, what do you do to negate that? Yeah, well I think the way to do it is like to, to, to get... It's, it's not about saying you need to do this. It's about getting them just to be... Giving them some, some uh, skills to be more self-aware mm -hmm. of who they are as human beings. And that's not in any way saying to them, you've got to do this, you've got to divulge your problems. Because they'll have less problems if they're more self-aware. Mm -hmm. That's why I think so. You can you can get to a young athlete by giving them skills around you know emotional intelligence, um, regulation, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you know, so you're actually solving the solving some of the issues while while they're while they don't even know it. Mm -hmm. So really, what we're trying to do is is to make them self-aware to such a point that they actually don't feel they need. To, divulge any personal problems because it's not bothering them you yeah. know because they've got more of an awareness about who they are is that psychology 101 i don't know is that well it kind of is in a way i don't know a psychologist but we we actually work with psychologists in this but it, it's sort of like it is but in sport it's 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 kind of it's way back in the in the in the middle ages in terms of this it's like you know it's really it's it's Sports can save a lot of money and do their athletes a lot of favors by, by spending a bit more time in this area, you know, mm -hmm. for sure. Athlete self-awareness or human self-awareness. I mean, there's some stuff that we're delivering in workshops that I've learned since I've retired. Mm. And I, I'm standing there talking to the athletes about this and part of my brain is going, I wish I'd known this when I was an athlete, you know, mm. and it's basic stuff, you know what I mean? Mm. So, um, uh, I think as you mentioned earlier on about a 14 year old athlete coming in, you know, you're kind of fast tracked. Suddenly you go straight to winning races and you're like, wow, I'm a, I'm a, now I'm a machine that needs to win races. And what happens is the human being gets parked a little bit. Yeah. Um, but in fact, the two need to move together. You know, the, the, the athlete needs to grow, sorry, the human being needs to grow at the same speed as the athlete. Yeah. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that when they retire, you have a fully developed athlete, but the human's going to be a 13 year old boy. Yeah. And that's that's one of the problems about the athlete retirement thing, is that there's lots of 13 year old kids in 35 year old bodies, you know? Yeah, and it's a bit dangerous. They don't want people to be basically emotionally immature. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then because the, you know, athletes are used to extremes, you know, like doing something like the Tour de France isn't your everyday run the mill thing, and it requires a certain mentality in a mm -hmm. certain way of being and that just doesn't disappear overnight 
So the whole risk and reward element of sport is still there, and you'll still chase it. Mm. So be it in, um, you know, it could come out in, in, in gambling, in recreational drugs, alcohol, whatever. It, that's just really that's feeding the risk and reward pathways that have been put in place from an early age. Yeah. So these are all things that need to be considered. So it's a seriously complex issue. It goes way beyond just finding a new job. It's like it's really about um, getting to know the human. Yeah, you know exactly. A lot of people. What I say to coaches when we're educating them, we do work with coaches too. Is I look the difference between do you want to be a great coach or a good coach? And the great coaches are the ones, you know, who always used to ask you how's life, how how are things going. You know, they'd always go that bit deeper with you mm -hmm. and ask you what was going on. Um, like anyone can be a good coach. You can be a good coach by just doing the numbers and, and you know um, rattling off training programs. But to be a great coach, you've got to go that extra step mm. and tap into who it is you're actually coaching, mm. and not just the numbers. Coaches don't realize that you know you could be a father figure. You could be a father figure for an athlete, and you wouldn't know. You've got no idea because the athlete would never tell you. That's the role a coach might have. And lots of coaches don't understand that. Mm. So if you're being using, you know, language that's not favourable, um, then that's going to impact that athlete a lot more than than just another athlete who doesn't think you're a father figure. Mm. You know, so it's it's a very delicate job coaches have. You know, Absolutely. and I think the more the world evolves and the more that the you know um, we're dealing with a new breed of athlete now. You know, the new generation are different to us. You know, like they've got way more distractions in their life. They've got social media. They've got all these things going on. So coaches need to evolve with that as well. Mm -hmm. Like the old school isn't good enough anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, like we have to start looking at the you know, the old school is great, but also the, you know bringing in this new school stuff and this more this kind of awareness stuff is coming more into play. Yeah. You know, so coaching really has to evolve with the times, I and I don't think it has. Should the Olympics go back to a more amateur model? The government remits that suggest that gold is good and gold, and more gold is better. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it's killing off the beauty of what the Olympics once were. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's very interesting, the Olympic thing, because, um, you know, there is the drive to get the gold medals, and, and you know, the, I think in that drive, um, a lot of the personality can get lost. Mm -hmm. um, I think the talent ID, I think the talent ID system is, is 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 very destructive, or can be very destructive. Okay. Because what you're doing is you're you're measuring kids um, based on their height, their weight, uh, or their potential to be good at that sport. But what they're doing is like you're actually sowing a seed in a young person's head of like you're good enough to go to the Olympics, or you're good enough to win at the Olympics. But in fact, you know, the intrinsic side of sport, by the way you start sport in the first place, is gone. So from an early age they're told, you're going to go to the Olympics, so you have got potential to go to the Olympics. Whereas, say, I started sport, not from that side, but yes. because I loved rowing. And I loved rowing because I loved being on the river, it was a beautiful place, I had my friends there, my family there, everything was perfect. Um, and I did it because I loved it. The winning came in later. Success was superfluous. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. So, so that was a much healthier way to come into a sport. Yeah. Whereas the talent ID kids, you see them time and time again, um, completely hollowed out kids at the age of 17 when they realize their Olympic dream is finished. You know what I mean? That they're not going to make it. Yeah. You know, and they've been on that path to be like, okay, you, you can make it. So, yeah. so everything they've done, if they don't make the Olympic Games, they're a failure. Yeah. And that's that's the wrong message. I think to be sending to, to kids, they need to get kids in because they love doing it. That's the first thing. Don't yeah. tell them they can make the Olympics until they can really think it, they can make the Olympics. It's an interesting premise. I think now I need to call Rowan Dennis and Joanne Rousel and. and <laughs> And make sure I, because they're both the result of talent. I do. Yeah, I'm not saying you know that, that it hasn't worked. I mean, it has worked. You see at the Olympics, it, it has worked. You know, like they, there is athletes winning gold medals at the Olympics with confident talent ID system. But you're talking like 5%. Yeah. 
you know, like which is which is very little. What about all the other ones? Yeah. You know, who didn't make it? Now, like that's th there's a whole raft of kids out there, young people out there who who will be damaged by the talent ID system, but we will never know who they are. Yeah. You know, and so so that's so that's that perspective of the whole Olympic thing. The other perspective is that. Um, if I looked at the Rio Olympics this time around, uh, the people who stood out for me were the personal, either people I knew personally or people who, st who had personalities. Mm. So I don't know if you saw the O'Donovan brothers, the Irish. So the, Ireland won its first Olympic medal in rowing, which of course I'm very connected to because wow. we went and tried to win a medal and never did. Yeah. But these boys, two brothers, won the Olympic gold medal. Wow. Oh, sorry, Olympic silver medal in, in rowing. And they were two of the stars of the Olympics because of their personalities. Yeah. Right, the result was incredible, but it was the interviews they gave afterwards. It was them being themselves. They were do they were doing it. You could tell they were doing rowing because they loved it. Yeah. And they were living in the moment, and there was nothing else. Yeah. And they became infectious. Like the the whole country, Ireland went nuts about them, and all over the world. Like we're talking, their first interview got like four or five million hits on YouTube. I, I think it, the Olympics has changed. And as we said earlier on about you know going with the times, you know I have a friend here in Sydney who's got two teenage kids. Mm. The Olympics were coming up, and she was like, "Okay, kids, let's watch the Olympics." You know, you know the diving's on tonight. They were just they didn't, they didn't give them monkeys. <laughs> they had their computer games. They had their Snapchats. They had all these other distractions. Yeah. The Olympics was like boring for them. Yeah. So this is the way it's going. Yes. You know, so the 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 the, the sporting endeavors aren't enough anymore. No. You know, if the if the Olympics want to capture the audience going forward, they're going to have to look to other ways, just more than performances. I reckon. You know, when I was growing up, when the Olympics were on, it was literally every kid imagined going to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was literally everyone wanted to do it, either the World Cup in football mm -hmm. or the Olympics, mm -hmm. and um, that's different now, for sure. It's not something that kids necessarily aspire to. I think special kids now do, but like in terms of you know, the, your average kid probably doesn't aspire to go to the Olympics, and that's going to change everything because what happens you know when an Olympic medalist came back from the Olympics in the eighties, for instance, or the nineties, it was like they were on everything, mm -hmm. you know, like the awesome foursome were on all the mm -hmm. on the television ads, and same back in Ireland, like if somebody won an Olympic gold medal, they were heroes. That was it. They were set for life. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, that personality trait will, will live with them forever. Like I've been dealing with Nick Green recently, and he had that adulation of the gold medalist, and he assumes that I have that adulation of him, but I don't. Mm. And I look at him as an administrator who's been in a role for two years and has done, had a little impact. And so he, he's sort of like, "What are you talking about? But don't you know I'm good at what I do?" No, I don't, because I'm watching you, and it's not being very positive. It sounds a bit simplistic, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> Does yeah. that make sense? You know, like he, he, he's of the opinion that, that he, he's grown up with people saying, oh, you're the gold medalist. Oh, I remember that. I remember where I was when you won. Mm. How was it? You know? But yeah, and it's, it's interesting with that because it's like more and more that's, that's getting, getting less and less important. Mm -hmm. For people, and I think you know that's one of the challenges for the future Olympians and future sports stars coming back from from big events, expecting there to be you know lucrative deals, mm -hmm. um, people loving them. That's going to get less and less, I think, with this new generation because it's like, okay, it's the Olympic. Okay, well, here's a Pokemon. I'm going to chase that instead. <laughs> like, but it's like that thing about if you're watching a bike race and you're watching a watching them going going uphill and. And you're wanting your favorite to like hang on to the group, and then they start losing the wheel, and you're like, "Come on, they're just like." If they could, they would. But exactly. They did. Exactly. You know, yeah. and and and, and, and becoming from sport, like you understand the pain that they're going through and the reason why they can't hold the wheel. But the majority of the population don't. Yes. They just think they've given up. Yes. And that's you know. <laughs> One of the challenging things about being a sports person. Exactly, and there's many challenges during and after. So it's a pleasure chatting with you. We could talk all day, but I, yeah. I think we've got a dog on the head. Yeah. <laughs> thanks very much. Yeah, thanks very much. My pleasure. Yeah. Cool.